Uh, Cleewick by Emily Carr, Chapter 4, Kamshua. Tanu, Skadans, and Kamshua lie fairly close to each other on the map. Yet each is quite unlike the others when you come to it. All have the West Coast wetness, but Kamshua seems always to drip, always to be blurred with mist, its foliage always to hang wet and heavy. Kamshua rain soaked my paper. Kamshua rain trickled among my paints. Only one house was left in the village of Kamshua, a large, low, and desolately forsaken house that had a carefully padlocked door and gaping hole in the wall. We spent a miserable night in this old house. All our bones were pierced with chill. The rain spat great drops through the smoke hole onto our fire. In comfortless, damp blankets, we got through the night. In the morning, Jimmy made so hot a fire that the rain splatters hissed when they dropped onto it. I went out to work on the leaky beach, and Jimmy rigged up a sort of shelter over my work so that the trickles ran down my neck <laughs> instead of my picture. But if I had possessed the arms and legs of a centipede, they would not have been enough to hold my things together to defy the elements' meanness toward my canopy, canopy, materials, and temper. Through the hole in the side of the house, I could hear the fretful mewings of the cat. Indian people and the elements give and take like brothers, accommodating themselves to each other's ways without complaint. My Indians never said to me, hurry and get this over so that we may go home and be more comfortable. Indians are comfortable everywhere. Not far from the house sat a great wooden raven mounted on a rather low pole. His wings were flattened to his sides. A few feet from him stuck up an empty pole. His mate had sat there, but she had rotted away long ago, leaving him moss-grown, dilapidated and alone to watch dead Indian bones, for these two great birds had been set, one on either side of the doorway of a big house that had been full of dead Indians who had died during a smallpox epidemic. Bursting growth had hidden house and bones long ago. Rain turned their dust into mud. These strong young trees were richer perhaps for that Indian dust. They grew up round the dilapidated old raven, sheltering him from the tearing winds now that he was old and rotting because the rain seeped through the moss that grew upon his back and in the hollows of his eye sockets. The Kamshua totem poles were dark and colorless, the wood toneless from pouring rain. When Jimmy, Louisa, the cat, and the missionary's daughter saw me squeeze back into the house through the hole and heard me say, done, they all jumped up. Curling the cat into her hat, Louisa set about packing. Jimmy went to prepare his boat. The cat was peeved. She, referred, she preferred Louisa's hat near the fire to in the outside rain. The memory of Kamshua is of a great lonesomeness smothered in a blur of rain. Our boat headed for sea. As we rounded the point, Kamshua was suddenly like something that had not quite happened. 